first welcome to our second session of uh, Ethics Rounds. Thanks for coming. Um, today's topic is listed up there, Medicine's Accountability When Treatment is Medically Futile. And this is um, presented uh, by the Ethics uh, Advisory Committee. It's um, cases um, taken um, from, 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 from our archives. Um, by the end of this session, uh, you all will be able to describe the elusive and ambiguous concept of futility, uh, describe Maryland law pertaining to medically ineffective treatments, describe approaches for addressing continued conflicts over family requests for medically ineffective treatments, and describe um, what I like to call a process-based approach to resolving conflicts about medical futility. Um, so let me... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, since I see this as a case-based approach to discussion rather than a lecture, uh, uh, let me start out with three different cases. Um, patient is a 72-year-old man with a history of uh, coronary artery disease, status post cabbage, admitted with pneumonia. He develops sepsis and, and is admitted to the ICU where he's, he's intubated, ventilated, given presses, norepinephrine and vasopressin, in addition to antibiotics. After three days in the ICU, his uh, condition deteriorates. He remains on presses, um, but if anything, at higher doses. And in fact, the third presser has been added, uh, and he develops renal failure. So the question is, uh, is with CPR, how many of you would consider CPR in the event of a cardiac arrest to be medically futile? Uh, how many people? would think that. Okay, a few. I know we're just warming up. Okay. Uh, all right, so uh, how many people think it would not be futile? Okay, how many people want to hear more? Okay, all right, good. So I'll continue. Um, patient is a 73-year-old retired machinist who suffered a noxic encephalopathy and renal failure following thoracic surgery for a thymus gland tumor. His doctors determined that he was in a persistent vegetative state and wanted to remove his dialysis port and write a DNAR order on him. The daughter did not accept this diagnosis, thought that the patient was responsive, and went to the court to seek legal guardianship of her father. The hospital opposed her petition, and in fact, they went to court and argued that the patient is dying and that dying is being prolonged by the treatment rendered. So, for this case, how many people think CPR would be medically futile? Okay. And how many people don't? Okay. So my, my reading is that more people think that in this case CPR would be medically futile than in the previous case. Okay. All right. Uh, someone's taking notes. Oh, by the way, this is being recorded for your listening pleasure afterwards. Okay. Um, um, this case, patient is a 71-year-old male with severe CAD, CHF, status cabbage, status receipt of a left ventricular assist device. Patient receives chronic dialysis and ventilatory support. The patient was receiving rehab at USH when chest pain and hypertension secondary to persistent GI bleeding required transfer to the University of Maryland. Patient is awake and alert. The medical opinion is that the GI bleeding is secondary to the mechanics of his non-pulsatile left ventricular assist device. This is a, a recognized entity where someone has um, um, chronic GI bleeding from the mechanics of the left ventricular assist device. Um, patient is presently requiring one unit of blood every other day. The medical team is of the opinion that this blood requirement will not decrease and hence, they will, and hence, they think that um, continuation of blood transfusions is medically futile. So, how many people, uh, oh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, instead of CPR, uh, how many people here think that the blood transfusions is medically futile? Okay, how many people think uh, blood transfusions is, is serving some kind of benefit? Okay, all right, good. So I present these cases um, uh, merely to warm you guys up. Um, 
uh, to discuss about futility. And in its um, very generic formal form, um, the definition of futility represents a futile intervention is one that will not accomplish the intended goal. And we have examples from Greek mythology. Uh, here we have uh, on, the left, on your left, Sisyphus in the underworld who was um, punished by the gods and his punishment was to um, roll up a heavy boulder to the top of the mountain uh, and, then, um, and then after that the boulder would roll down and his job was to keep on uh, um, um, pushing up the boulder until the boulder would stay in place but that was never going to happen. So that would be considered a futile um, um, activity. Or also, in from Greek mythology, we have the daughters of uh, Danius. Uh, the daughters, there's actually 50 daughters, that's another story, I guess, uh, uh, who killed their husbands on, on the wedding night. And uh, well, at least 49 of them did that. And they were punished to um, uh, filling up this basin. And one story has it was that the basin had uh, holes in it, and hence their goal of filling up the basin was considered a futile activity. So what is um, futility or in, in the um, um, practice of medicine, or what is medical futility? Uh, well, some examples. Uh, the intervention has no physiologic rationale. For example, treating an MI with antifungal therapy. I think we would all agree that that would be futile. Um, the intervention has already failed in the patient, continued asystole in the middle of an arrest, uh, despite uh, ACLS. Um, or if you have a, a, a cardiac arrest in the occurrence of ongoing septic shock with hypertension, and, and, and you keep on increasing the pressures, um, and some people might think that, um, uh, that uh, a cardiac arrest is a natural progression of the septic shock and hence further um, methods at um, attempts at resuscitation might be considered futile. Um, there are, I like to break down medical futility into two broad categories. One is considered quantitative futility where the intervention is considered to have a marginal or, or no physiologic effect. So we're talking about another word for quantitative futility would be physiologic futility. Um, and, and this is uh, hence what I call medicine-centric. On the other hand, we have what's um, called qualitative futility get back that slide. Yes, qualitative futility, where the intervention will sustain life, so it has a physiologic effect, but the quality of life is unacceptable to the patient. And I call this a patient-centric definition of futility, where it's the patient who defines the goals of treatment, defines whether a benefit is, is good enough to undergo um, the um, uh, requested intervention. So with, with all this background, let's uh, go through some, some more cases. So the patient is a 20-year-old male who is admitted to shock trauma with a gunshot wound to his chest, necessitating right pneumonectomy. Patient developed renal failure, warranting dialysis, ARDS, and, and subsequently the bronchial anastomosis to the, um, to the stump uh, where he had the pneumonectomy uh, had a leak and the patient had a bronchial pleural fistula which uh, necessitated the use of um, ECMO, extracorporeal uh, membrane oxygenation where you put the lungs at rest. Uh, so that was started and it involves large bore intravenous catheters and a machine that uh, takes out the CO2 from the uh, blood circulation and then adds back oxygen. So the lungs are not working at all. 
So two months later, the patient remains ECMO and is unable to be weaned from the ECMO. And in fact, the determination was that the uh, patient would never be able to be weaned from the ECMO. And um, for various reasons, the patient also was not a candidate for a lung transplant. I, I think that's, I think that's um, correct. So the patient is awake and alert. However, his decision-making capacity remains questionable. Um, and so the ICU attending and the surgical attending believes that continued ECMO is futile and tells the mother that ECMO will be turned off. The mother disagrees with this plan of action and insists that ECMO should be continued. She also states that until she is told that her son will die within a short period of time, she wants the ECMO to be continued. She says that her son is a fighter, and in her, in, in her conversations with him, he states he wants to live. So, so is ECMO medically futile? What do you all think? This is now your turn. Okay, all right, so, so, the, uh, um, so uh, we had one answer saying it's keeping him alive, it's doing its job, and then, uh, well, what is the goal? It, it depends on what is the goal. Um, so, okay, other thoughts? Uh, what, what, um, what, what, the last response? Yeah, could you? Stand up and um, I, I guess. Um, yeah, okay. Here's my mic. I did not plan on this. Um, I, it's just that I worked on this patient. Um, it was about two years ago. Um, but this guy had absolutely no quality of life. I mean, he was, we'd follow him, we'd move around the hospital, um, dialysis machine, ECMO machine, and event, and like, the weird thing is that he was awake, like he could understand, but basically it was like a head hooked to machines. Like his, the rest of his body was completely atrophied, like he couldn't move, couldn't talk, but he was awake. It was, but that's not quality of life to be. You know, the, you know under the definition of qualitative futility, it was very. Okay. Right. Does anybody feel that the patient or the family has a right to a lung transplant just because they want one? They want a lung transplant. Do the surgeons have to list them for a lung transplant and give them one? All right. Whatever. The surgeons don't feel he's a lung transplant candidate, don't want to list him, and, but, but the family wants one. You're talking about it's not a lung transplant candidate because of um, surgical techniques? Or? For whatever reason, they didn't list him. They felt that he was not an appropriate candidate for a lung transplant, but the family says he's a fighter, and in their conversations with him, they want him to live. So I agree. So the question is, why is ECMO any different? You're saying eventually he was going to die from something. Okay, very good. So what should we do? Now. Now, uh, there are some, some, maybe some things that we could do, but let's um, take on some more cases. Patient is a 46-year-old female with morbid obesity who was admitted with sepsis, shock, extensive paniculitis, and necrotic wounds along her flank and breast. Patient was treated with fluids, antibiotic pressures, ventilation, and chronic renal replacement therapy for her renal failure. Skin necrosis progressed, and it was felt that her disease process was not amenable to surgical intervention. The patient had some kind of vasculitis that couldn't be treated uh, surgically or by medication. Uh, shock trauma team felt that continued aggressive efforts would be medically futile. 
Uh, meetings were held with the family regarding this assessment. Family consisted of several siblings and a mother, and the mother and the sister requested all support. There were some disagreements between the siblings. The ethics service was, was consulted, uh, and, and they recommended documentation by two attendings in the medical record regarding assessment of fertility, informed the family, and help with transfer of the patient to another facility if requested by the family. If transfer cannot be carried out, then a court-appointed guardian should be pursued to replace the surrogate. Um, anyway, the uh, patient continued to receive full support with the hopes of the family of some meaningful recovery. That was their goal. Um, further hospital uh, patient suffered a cardiac arrest, was successfully resuscitated with ACLS. Further hospital costs was significant for continued episodes of sepsis and shock and subsequent MI. Uh, renal replacement therapy could not be tolerated um, due to hypertension. Family agreed finally to a DNAR and to withhold CRRT, but to try hemodialysis if tolerated and continue with the efforts to transfer the patient to a rehab facility when medically appropriate. Patient experienced seizures, seizures and became less responsive. Uh, and family meeting was held and consensus reached finally to stop dialysis and no escalation of treatment. However, the family requested the heat depressors and the ventilator at the present level. The next day, finally, the family came in and requested withdrawal of pressors and ventilatory support and the patient died shortly afterwards. Comments on this case? Um, this patient, I think, uh, was in the hospital for four months. Yes. Okay, good. Uh, good, good question. Uh, regarding uh, a limitation of resources, especially uh, 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 um, in this day and age with uh, uh, the economy. So, when, so the question is, when do we start considering limitations or, uh, of resources and, and, and how do we do it? How, how do we factor, if we want to factor that into the equation, how do we do it? Okay, so it, it, I agree. It is a justice is, it, it, issue. Um, uh, how do we make sure that the resources are shared equitably among all our citizens who need health care? Um, so, um, so, again, if you think this issue about resources needs to be factored in. How do we operationalize it? How do we fit it in? Okay, uh, right, so if it's, if it's um, let me put this on the table to summarize your thoughts. If, it, if it's considered medically, physiologically futile to the best of our abilities, okay, regardless of whether the patient is 20 or 80, okay, um, uh, uh, should, should we continue that type of treatment? And, and I would maintain that uh, the um, resources issue, you know, is there for sure. But even if it wasn't there, uh, do we have an obligation to, to give treatments that we think are medically futile? Um, and, and I agree that the resource issue, justice issue, only adds adds uh, to the um, um, uh, reasons uh, uh, of, of not to continue. Okay. Let me. Let me. Um, so. Um, so the questions that I think you all are asking, do patients have a right to medical treatment that is likely to be ineffective, medically ineffective, okay? Uh, so we're factoring out qualitative futility for the rest of this discussion. However, citing medical futility, do physicians have the right to withhold treatment even when the alternative is death? And is resorting to the concept of medical futility effective in these situations? Um, why are these cases so difficult? Um, physicians don't want to be forced to provide treatments that they consider is medically and hence morally wrong um, for the practice of medicine. 
On the other hand, families don't want to be excluded from determining the best care for the loved ones by the veto of doctors or ethics committees. So ethics committees, we don't make decisions. Um, taxpayers and insurance policy holders that pay for this care may object to the funding private family non-medical goals. Uh, and essentially, sometimes there's no consensus definition of medical fertility. So I think we're getting closer and closer. Uh, again, why won't the family let me stop? Misunderstanding about prognosis, distrust of physicians' prognostications, conflict within family, overwhelming grief, ulterior, ulterior motives. Is that check coming in? Uh, and we've had those cases as well. Deep moral disagreement about what constitutes a life worth living. Um, so having said all that, what is the standard of care regarding medical futility? Uh, here's a statement from the AMA Code of Medical Ethics. All healthcare institutions, whether large or small, should adopt a policy of medical futility. Policies of medical futility should follow due process in specific cases. Earnest attempts to deliberate and negotiate what constitutes futile treatment and what falls within acceptable limits. Joint decision making to the maximum extent possible. Negotiations with help of consultants as appropriate. Uh, and they also go on to say, involvement of ethics committee if disagreements are irresolvable. If review supports physician versus an unpersuaded patient, seek transfer of the patient to another institution. If the review supports the patient uh, uh, versus an unpersuaded physician, arrange transfer within the institution. I think that means arrange transfer of the patient within the institution as opposed to the physician. Okay. Um, if transfer is not possible, the intervention need not be offered. If transfer is not possible, the intervention need not be offered. Uh, easier said than done. Uh, most, cases, most cases are resolved at the bedside, albeit sometimes uh, uh, after a long period of time. That, Believe it or not, sometimes we do get consensus, but sometimes it takes a very long time. We have to uncover miscommunications, enhance trust, and sometimes allow for time, though I must admit four or five months uh, may not be uh, uh, the answer. Uh, other cases, difficult and sometimes impossible to transfer these patients. Patients and surrogates and doctors are often strangers. Uh, we don't have these long-lasting relationships that enhances trust. So what is needed for intractable cases? What would you like to have for these intractable cases? There ought to be a law, is that the answer? Uh, well, there are 16 states who have a law and counting. Okay, here are the list of states. As you can see, Maryland is, is, among, is among the, uh, uh, the list. And they're all somewhat similar to the Tennessee statute, which incorporates the AMA process approach. Um, and the Tennessee futility law uh, says a healthcare provider or institution may decline to comply with an individual instruction or healthcare decision that requires medically inappropriate health care or, or futility. Um, I think I might have eliminated that. And, and the process is, once that determination is made, the process is to inform the patient or the surrogate of that decision, continued care until, tra un care until transfer to another physician or facility is arranged, assist with the transfer, and then if transfer is impossible after a reasonable period, the health care provider or institution shall not be compelled to comply. That's the Tennessee statute. Uh, Texas. Uh, has a, also adopted a procedural approach. Actually, in the Texas statute, they never define futility. They realize that you just can't define futility, leave it up to the medical profession. The law defines a process. The family must be given written information regarding ethics consultation process. If, if the physicians have determined on their definition that something is futile, the process is you next take it to the ethics committee. Families informed that the ethics committee is involved. 
The family is given 48 hours notice and invitation to participate in the consult. After the uh, uh, deliberations, the family is given a written report. If the dispute is not resolved, the hospital, working with the family, must try to arrange a transfer to another provider, physician, and institution. Uh, however, there's a limit of 10 days. If after 10 days no such provider can be found, the physician may unilaterally withhold or withdraw the treatment. Uh, the party that disagrees may appeal to the state court uh, for an extension of time, and that extension of time could be granted by the judge. If the judge, only if the judge feels that uh, more time is needed to find another provider, meaning that there's something in the works. If there's nothing in the works, then uh, and no extension is, is need to be granted by the judge. Um, and um, so if either the family does not seek an extension or the judge fails to grant one, futile treatment may be unilaterally withdrawn under the Texas law. Uh, some people think that uh, this uh, uh, goes against good due process and it's too heavy handed on the side of the medical profession and the hospital. Um, Maryland law, and uh, we have representation from hospital counsel here, and I appreciate your presence. So make sure, if, I, if I'm not getting this right, let me know. Um, uh, Maryland law defines what is medically ineffective treatment. They don't use the word futility uh, because they wanted to get away from that for whatever reason. Uh, but anyway, medically ineffective treatment is treatment that to a reasonable degree of certainty, a reasonable degree of certainty, will not prevent further deterioration of the patient's health status or will not prevent impending death. Uh, this is uh, considered to be an objective determination based on uh, a clinical experience and, uh, and, and what's reported in the literature. It's not based on absolute certainty. It requires certification of two physicians. Um, and the attending physician must inform the patient or the patient's agent or surrogate. The patient surrogate may request transfer to another provider. Pending transfer, the providers must comply with the request for treatment if failure to comply would result in the death of the patient. Uh, and uh, so uh, Maryland law doesn't say, doesn't give the next step after that. It uh, doesn't give a time limit like in Texas. doesn't say absolutely that, like in Tennessee, if treatments, if transfer is found to be impossible, then the physicians may um, withdraw, uh, withhold the treatment. Uh, uh, however, um, uh, what, what, is, um, what is the next step in, in this institution is, is if unable to transfer the patient and conflict persists, the hospital may go to court to request an appointment of a legal guardian to replace the surrogate. Um, and, and that could be the next step. Uh, let me know if that's, uh, anybody would like to elaborate on that? Great, so maybe. Oh, well, it depends on the judge, well, yeah. right? Well, well, the judge is the arbiter of the facts. Okay, right. I'm not, yeah, I'm not saying this is going to rule in favor of the physician. This is a process. That's... Usually, is uh, isn't the little guy in the pocket that the judge gave the Russians to the little guy in what to do? Okay.
if known. Even if it's futile? Even if it's futile. How do we know we won't get a judge? Unless we go to court. 55-year-old male with necrotizing cellulitis, requiring fasciotomies. He was sent to us for rehab. He split thickness skin graft to the old wounds and was, uh, was here for three days and discharged to uh, back to us. Uh, however, the patient uh, was readmitted a few days. A patient uh, got septic, got transferred to another facility, got retransferred back here with septic shock uh, after having a cardiac arrest, uh, exploratory laparotomy with significant for toxic megacolon. Total abdominal co um, collected. colectomy was done with N ileostomy. Abdomen was left open with wound vacuum. Vacuum, multiple washouts. The abdomen was finally closed. Hospital cost significant for the usual sepsis, shock, coagulopathy, anemia, thrombocytopenia, renal failure, hypertension. Shock trauma team believed that continued treatment is futile for this patient. Um, what should be done now? I, I think, if anything, uh, I guess maybe we're realizing that. Uh, we don't know what the next step might be. Well, uh, um, have a family meeting, okay? Shock trauma team told the family that further escalation of treatment in CPR is medically futile, okay? Shock trauma team read the Maryland definition of futile medically ineffective therapy, thought CPR, and continued further escalation of treatment was futile. The ethics service was made aware and agreed. Um, family was informed and did not disagree. All current therapies were continued, uh, except for uh, there was no escalation of treatment. Next day, the patient experienced progressive hypertension and bradycardia and then cardiac arrest. The patient was made comfortable and died. Um, so I, I call this the middle ground approach, no escalation of treatment, where you know sometimes family members may be unwilling to withdraw, uh, but uh, uh, we could spend a whole day exploring the psychological, emotional differences between withdrawing and withholding. Um, and um, it may be easier for the family to say, uh, to not, not object to no escalation of treatment. Um, and, uh, and, then, and then with um, on time, they may come around, just like in the previous case, to say, okay, just withdraw everything. Um, if they're comfortable with this patient, um, experience uh, bradycardic and then cardiac arrest and, and, and then die. And then um, this last case, patient uh, with metastatic colon cancer and with all the, the usual stuff, hemicolectomy, well, that's not usual, but anyway, prior discussions with the sister and the son reveals that the patient had previous, previously expressed desires to want to live at all costs. Hence, the family requested CPR and to do everything. The patient continued to be agitated, required high doses of propofol to achieve comfort. Due to continued deterioration, it became clear that the patient would not recover to the point where he would ever receive chemotherapy. Uh, the next day, a family meeting was held, and the family was told that many of the treatments was, were futile and was not going to be done. And so, uh, well, uh, in the interest of time, I was going to ask you, how do you approach the family? Uh, do you ask, do you want us to do CPR if your son heart stops? Or do you state categorically, CPR is not indicated, we, it will not be performed? And then you discuss uh, uh, avenues of comfort care and appropriateness of other life-sustaining treatments. And I maintain the answer is the second one. Um, and here's the reason for that. Uh, oh. I think I skipped that. Uh, oh, well, anyway, after this slide, family was told that these treatments would not be administered. And in fact, the family did not disagree and actually felt relieved that they didn't have to make these decisions. And if 
a medical treatment is believed to be physiologically futile, then it should not be presented as an option. We shouldn't be asking them, do you want this stuff? They may, some families will still disagree, but we shouldn't be asking, do you want this? Because that puts the burden on the family to say yes or no. And so I maintain that the mere offer of a CPR implies to the patient and the family that CPR might be useful. Uh, or, or, or else, why is it on the table? Um, and hence, not presenting CPR as an option is ethically defensible. Not presenting CPR as an option. And so we may be able to relieve the burden uh, of the family uh, by, 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 uh, by not asking, but in, instead telling. And if the family wants to disagree, that's fine. Uh, then we go through the other stuff. But let me, um, I had another case, but you could read about that on your own. Maybe I'll offer that as CME credit evaluation. But let me end with this slide, if I could get to it. The bottom line slide. I know you're all waiting for it. Um, here it is. Uh, uh, yeah, here it is. Here's a, we all like algorithms, OK? This will only take 20 seconds, the algorithm, OK? Uh, attending believes that treatment is medically futile. If the patient and surrogate agrees, no problem, right? I put that in the small box because it rarely does. But sometimes it does. Patient surrogate requests treatment, obtain consultations from the clergy, palliative care, ethics, uh, case manager, social work. Uh, if the consultants offer an alternative uh, opinion, uh, then offer transfer to a new position. If the consultants concur, Offer the middle ground approach. Say no escalation of treatment, and then let's see what happens. Also, sometimes it's useful to say, OK, we'll continue treatments for another week, and let's see what happens. And this gives the family the, the thought that uh, you know, they're being listened to, uh, they are an equal partner, and, and that they could see the results of what's happening. And this gives more time to deliberate. Uh, if the patient surrogate disagrees, then we go through the legal, the murky legal route. It's murky because we don't know what's the end of the trail, but we do offer transfer. If transfer is not possible, go to court to replace the surrogate. Um, however, I would like to maintain that I think that most of our cases could be resolved you know, with continued discussion. So I must admit, you know, um, uh, uh, several months is, is, is probably crossing some kind of line. Um, and in which case we, we need to go through this route. But I think sometimes we could, you know, if we offer a time period, let the family um, uh, have more discussions among themselves and, and, and all of that. And um, so I hope that, um, you know, you enjoyed this um, discussion and see us next, next month for yet another case presentation. Thank you very much.